This is a study about when a day begins. I just want to thank you for being interested in listening to this study. Um, I just want to go through and, and see what the scriptures teach us about the question, when does a day begin? This is not a question that a lot of us ask because we've been raised in traditions that tell us when a day begins and, and we've been taught that from the time we were children. Um, personally, I grew up keeping the Sabbath. Um, I always kept it from sundown to sundown. We would have Friday afternoons rushing around, trying to get dinner prepared, trying to get the house clean, trying to get gas in the car. There was a lot of, of chaos <laughs> on Friday afternoons. And I never questioned when I became an adult and I had my own children. And for years, I have followed the evening to evening model that I was always taught. I never even questioned it. To be honest, I never understood what the evening to evening was in scripture. I, I would look for it, I would try to understand it, then it would say, and there was evening and morning, day one. And I'd think, what does that mean? I don't understand. How does that fit in? You know? And I would go through and I'd look at the words and I just couldn't understand it for myself. Um, so what I've done is I'm just going to go through the scriptures and kind of show you maybe something that you haven't seen before in the scriptures, something that I definitely never saw before. And I've realized that there are earthly understandings as well as spiritual understandings. And a lot of times we understand the surface level, we get that part, but we don't really understand the higher level, the spiritual understanding that Yahweh Father is trying to teach us. And so I've gone through and I've put together this little study and I just want to share with you what I've discovered and how it's really impacted me. It's impacted my walk, it's impacted my understanding of Yeshua and, and my relationship with the Father. And I just want to share that with you. So let's go through and see what does the scriptures actually teach. We're all familiar with Genesis 1.1. What we may not understand is that this is a summary verse. In the beginning, Yah created the heaven and the earth. It's a summary verse. He's telling us what is about to happen. The word created is bara. It's a primitive root word, and it means to cut, to carve out, to form, to separate, and shape. He hasn't done this yet. He's about to do this. We're about to see him do what, he, what he's just told us is going to happen. Um, some of the word study sources that I'm using is from Jesenius's Hebrew Chaldee Lexicon and also Strong's Concordance. Um, there may be some additional sources as you go through and, and start searching words, you may find um, additional sources, but I haven't listed them all because those are my main sources. That's where I, where I began. So if you want to look up some of these words for yourself, those are the sources that I was using for these words. Genesis 1-2, and I put this into two parts, and the earth, Aretz, was without form, Tohu, and void, Bohu, and darkness, Koshek, was upon the face, Panaim, of the deep, Tehum. This is the pre-existing condition of the earth. The earth, Aretz, figuratively, represents Sheol, death, a place of no return, exile. There's different definitions for Eretz, but this one fits the context of the verse, as we'll see as we continue to go through these words. And the earth was without form 
tohu, means nothingness, confusion, chaos, a wasteland. And void, bohu, waste, emptiness, an undistinguishable ruin. And darkness, koshek, was upon the face of the deep. Darkness is just, it just means the absence of light. Figuratively, if you're in darkness, there's misery, destruction, death, ignorance, sorrow, and wickedness. We see that light and darkness are compared repeatedly throughout scripture. And darkness is a bad thing. It's death, it's wickedness. And then we have the word face, panim, which has the root word pana, which means to turn, either away from or turn towards or to return. And the deep is tehum, and it means the abyss or the grave. It comes from the root word hum, to distract, to murmur, roar, discomfort. And the word whom is compared to hamam, which means to confuse, destroy, vex, trouble, and crush. All of these words are describing the pre-creation condition of the earth. It's not telling us that, that Yah formed and created this. It's telling us what it was like before his presence appears. And then we're going to see his presence in Genesis 1-2 in part 2. And the spirit, the Ruach, of Elohim was hovering, Rakaf, over the face of the waters, Mayim. So Yah sees the earth's condition and he is moved with compassion. The spirit, the Ruach, means to smell, to perceive, to understand. And hovering, some versions will say moved, is the word rakaf, and it means to be moved, relaxed, or agitated with feelings of tender love. And the word mayim is waters, it's a dual word, and it has some neutral usages in scripture. It also has living water, um, when, when you put living in front of it, that's different than just waters. But when you look up the word, a lot of times you're going to see this picture of wasting, danger, violence, even compares it to urine. So what we're seeing in this verse is that, that Father came along and he saw the condition, the hopelessness of the, of the earth. And it, he was moved with compassion. This is the first time that we see the incredible mercy and compassion of the Father for a, an earth that could not save itself. And that's very important when you're understanding the spiritual context of so much that's going to come in the future when you continue to read through the scriptures all the way through the New Testament. But the first time that we see his compassion is right here in Genesis 1-2. So let's summarize Genesis 1-2. The earth was nothingness, confusion, chaos, a wasteland, an emptiness, an undistinguishable ruin, and misery, destruction, death, ignorance, sorrow, and wickedness was on the face of the abyss, the grave. And the perception, the understanding of Elohim was agitated with tender feelings of love over the surface, the turning away of the wasting and the violence. So we're seeing that his presence was not in the earth, but he saw the earth and he had compassion. Then we move on to Genesis 1-3. And Elohim said, let there be light, and there was light. This is the first creative act, the spoken word, which brought a contrast 
to the pre-existing darkness on the earth. The word light is or, it means to dawn, daybreak, or morning. And we see here that the light didn't destroy the darkness. It didn't destroy the death and the wickedness that pre-existed. What it did is that the light challenged the darkness for dominion over the earth. Genesis 1-4, and Elohim saw the light, the dawn, the daybreak, the morning, that it was good, it was tov. And Elohim divided, that's the word badal, the light from the darkness. Tob is good, it means pleasant, joyful, pleasing. So Elohim saw the dawn, the morning, that it was pleasant, it was joyful, and it was pleasing. And so Elohim divided, badal, means he distinguished between, it means to separate as by a veil, a wall, or a fence. He separated the light from the dark. Yah divided between the existing death and the life that he brought and created for the earth. He distinguished between the two, the wickedness, the darkness, and the light, the life. Genesis 1.5, and Elohim called the light day, that's the word yom, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. Now, yom is the word day, and it means a period of time. Figuratively, it's a day, a year, a millennium, 1,000 years. And night is la'il, it's gloom. It's the opposite of day. It is the absence of light. And it comes from the root word lul, which is a staircase with steps or a ladder. And it's compared to the word lule, which are twisted stairs spiral stairs, hooks that attach curtains. It, it's a picture of the day being the predominant focus and the night being like a spiral staircase or hooks that would hold um, two panels of, of curtains together. And you can see that twisted stairs connect the main floors in a structure. So the night is connecting the main focus in the creation, which is the daytime. We're talking about destination versus the transportation between the two. This is all about Yeshua. I hope that you are starting to see how the, this is all talking about Yeshua. In John 1, 4 through 5, it says, In Him was life and life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. In Colossians 1.15, he says, He is the image of the invisible Elohim, the firstborn over all creation. And in John 1, 1 through 3, he says, In the beginning, Bereshit, the beginning, Genesis, was the Word, and the Word was with Elohim, and the Word was Elohim. So when does day one begin, and when does day one end? In Genesis 1-5, it says, And Elohim called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. Let there be light is the spoken word. Remember, we just saw that in the beginning was the word. The first creative act was the words, let there be light. Yeshua is called the firstborn of creation. He is the light of the world. And then it tells us, and then the evening and the morning, day one. Day two begins in the morning when day one ends. Ends. So when do we see that Elohim created the heavens and the earth? Because that's what we're told he's doing in Genesis 
Created is the word bara. It means to cut, to carve out, to form by cutting, separate, or shape. So on day two, we see that the heavens are being created. On day two, he divided the firmament, the waters above, from below, so the waters of heaven, from the waters of the earth. And on day three, he's forming the earth. It says that he divided the dry land from the seas and also brought forth seed-bearing life, grass, herbs, fruit trees. So what you're seeing is the potential for life began when he said, let there be light. There's a second witness to the creation account. We can find that in 2 Samuel 22 and in Psalm 18. David compares his distress at the hands of his enemies to the condition of the earth before creation, before the presence of Yahweh came in to the earth. And then David compares the creation of the heavens and the earth with Yah delivering him from his enemies, the enemies that he could not deliver himself from. We've got this picture of the earth being unable to deliver itself, being covered in darkness, in chaos, in wickedness. And here David is comparing his situation to the condition of the earth. He was without hope until Yahweh has compassion on him. In 2 Samuel 22, 5-7, it reads, When the waves of death compassed me, the floods of ungodly men made me afraid. The sorrows of hell compassed me about. The snares of death prevented me. In my distress, I called upon Yah and cried to my Elohim, and he did hear my voice out of his temple, and my cry did enter into his ears. Now we see Yah's response to David's cry of distress. There went up smoke out of his nostrils, and fire out of his mouth devoured. Coals were kindled by it. He bowed the heavens also and came down, and darkness was under his feet. And he rode upon a cherub and did fly, and he was seen upon the wings of the wind. And he made darkness pavilions round about him, dark waters and thick clouds of the skies. Through the brightness before him were coals of fire kindled. So we're seeing light coming down from heaven to this earth, and there's darkness under his feet. The darkness is, is spreading out like tents, pavilions around him as he's coming through, bringing the brightness, and the, the coals of fire are being kindled, and, and you get this picture of, of the coals hitting the dark waters and creating thick clouds in the skies is a, is a chemical reaction between the heat and the water. And that's in 2 Samuel 22, 9 through 13. And then it says, Yahweh thundered from heaven, and the Most High uttered His voice. We see that in Genesis. He said, let there be light. And here in 2 Samuel, He says, He uttered His voice, and he sent out arrows and scattered them, lightning and discomfited them. So here we're seeing creation day two and day three. And the channels of the sea appeared. The foundations of the world were discovered at the rebuking of Yahweh at the blast of the breath of his nostrils. He sent from above. He took me. He drew me out of many waters. David's comparing himself here to the earth being rescued from death, from the grave, from being held by hell. It's that he's comparing his situation to pre-creation earth. And he delivered me from my strong enemy and from them that hated me, for they were too strong for me. 
The earth could not rescue itself, but Yah was moved with compassion and tender love, and he came down and he brought the light, the potential for life to exist. So here we have a creation timeline. You've got pre-creation, darkness, death, and distress had sole dominion. And then day one begins, when Yah uttered his voice, let there be light, let there be life. Day two begins at light, when he creates the heavens, dividing the waters above from the waters below. Then you have day three, which also begins again at the light, when he divides the dry land from the seas. Yah isn't darkness but he perceives darkness. In 1 John 1, 5, we read, And then this is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you, that Elohim is light, and in him is no darkness at all. And in Job 34, 21 through 22, For his eyes are upon the ways of man, and he seeth all his goings. There is no darkness, nor shadow of death, where the workers of iniquity may hide themselves. Yahweh is not darkness. Pre-existing condition of the earth is darkness. It's chaos, it's death, it's the abyss. That is without the presence of the Father. Yeshua is compared to the Son. He's the light. He's also called the bridegroom. In Malachi 4.2 it says, But to you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings. This is the Son, S-U-N, not S-O-N. The Son of Righteousness shall arise just like he did on day one in the creation account. In Psalm 19.4, it says, their line is gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, S-U-N, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. Again, Yeshua is always compared to the light, the word that was in the beginning. In Psalm 84:11. For the Yahweh Elohim is a sun and a shield. Psalm 89, 36, His seed shall endure forever, and His throne as the sun before me. Matthew 17, 2, And was transfigured before them, and His face did shine as the sun, and His raiment as white as the light. This is the transfiguration of Yeshua when, when the apostles were there and, and they saw this happen in front of them and they're describing him and his appearance when he was transfigured and his face did shine as the sun. Again, he's never compared to darkness. He is always the light. He is always the sun. In Revelation 1.16, again, Yeshua is described and it says, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. The believers in Yeshua are commanded to walk in the light. In 1 Thessalonians 5.5 5, we read, You are the sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. In John 12.36, while you have the light, believe in the light that you may become sons of light. In Ephesians 5, 8, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. When was the earth in darkness? Before the light came. When were we in darkness? Before we had the light of Yeshua. And in Revelation 12, 1, we see a description of the woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of 12 stars. Now, if you recall, in 2 Samuel, 
that it says that Yah came down as light with the darkness under his feet. The darkness fled away. It was under his feet. Here, the woman is clothed with the sun, the light of Yeshua, who's described in, in Revelation 1 as having the countenance of the sun. And here is the woman clothed with the sun, and she has the moon, which is the lesser light, represents the night, under her feet. It's the same picture of, of creation and David's account of creation. And here, the final elect, the, the woman who gave birth to the man-child, is clothed with the sun. So why does it matter when a day begins? If we're just looking at it from a surface level understanding, from the earthly understanding, we might think that it really doesn't matter, that it's not that important. But we've just seen scripture verses where it talks about the believers in Yeshua walking in the light, being the light. We are supposed to be like Yeshua, who is the light. In Mark 7, 7, we read, How be it in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men, for laying aside the commandment of Elohim, Ye hold the tradition of men as the washing of pots and cups and many other such like things ye do. There's a lot of things that we have been taught that are not true. They're traditions. They sounded really good at one point. Uh, maybe somebody came along that was very charismatic and they started teaching it and, and people started to believe it, they started to teach it to other people and it, and it just spread. But we have, in this day, in this hour, we have this unveiling, this apocalypse that is occurring right now. And the Father is trying to open our eyes, not only to the literal text, but also to the higher spiritual understanding of why we do the things we do and what he is asking of us so that we can be the light of the world. You know, a lot of times you'll hear people say, well, you're being a Pharisee or you're being legalistic. But when you read this verse, Mark 7, 7, what you see is that being a Pharisee or being legalistic literally means following your own man-made commandments traditions and doctrines. That was the sin of the Pharisees. They were into tradition and their traditions denied the power and the commandments of Yah. Traditions can result in empty worship. What can happen is we can begin proclaiming a profane day holy and a holy day profane. We must always test our traditions and doctrines against the Word. We must understand the surface level, the earthly understanding, as well as the spiritual level, and how the Father has been teaching the spiritual understanding to us, and we haven't been seeing it. We've only been seeing the surface level, and because our traditions have corrupted the surface level, we end up in vain worship. We don't mean to be, and we know the Father understands that we have been taught a lot of lies. But when the Father begins to reveal truth, it's up to us to make a choice. Whom will we serve? Will we serve the Father in spirit and in truth? Or will we serve our traditions? Our traditions that are vain worship. How does following a calendar rooted in darkness and death reflect the true gospel of Yeshua? Are we to reflect the earth when it was covered in darkness before the creation of the world? Or after the light of Yeshua entered the world? In Acts 26, 
18, it says, to open their eyes, it's talking about the Gentiles, and to turn them from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan unto Elohim. This is what we see in Genesis 1-2. The power of Satan held dominion over the earth. And the light of Yeshua came down to turn the earth from darkness into light. He came and he died on the cross to take us out of the darkness, the commandments and the doctrines of men which made void the Torah, which made void the word, the spoken word of Yah that we find throughout the Old Testament. And the apostles' mission and our mission is to go out and be the light and to turn those who are out of relationship with the Father. We are to turn them from the darkness, the misery, the wickedness, the chaos, the truly heartbreaking, sad condition that they're in and bring them to the light, to the morning, to the dawn of Yeshua, the life. But this is oftentimes throughout history been thwarted by the enemy. And we see this again in Luke 16, 8. It says, For the sons of this world are more shrewd in their generation than the sons of light. The apostles came and they went out and they, they taught the true gospel. They taught the true scriptures. The same gospel that they've had from the very beginning. They went out and they taught it again. However, the sons of the world were more shrewd in their generation, and that message was subverted, and darkness came in again, and darkness was ruling over the earth again in false doctrines, in vain worship. But this is a time when an apocalypse is occurring. The unveiling is occurring, and the sons of light are being called forth again. False doctrines exist to give power to Satan. And we need to be the light of the world. We need to be taking that power back to the light and letting the light shine on that and win those victories in the heavenlies, in the spiritual realm, because we are in a spiritual battle right now, every day. Darkness is trying to come back into our lives, into our camps, into our hearts. And we have to be walking in the light and be sons of light. And that means that we're not married to tradition. We're not married to comfortable doctrines that make us feel good, but that we're willing to take all of our doctrines, all of our beliefs, and Put them at the feet of the Father and say, Father, shine the light of Yeshua on these doctrines and these traditions. Show me if this is truth. That's what we all have to be willing to do. And that's what I'm, I'm praying that all of you would do. You would go to the Father. You would go to the scriptures. You would study these things out for yourselves. And you would ask the Holy Spirit, to give you understanding. Because I can tell you something and you think it sounds really great. And then someone else comes along and they'll tell you something entirely different. And if they are charismatic, if they seem like a really good guy or girl, then you might be blown about by the wind of that doctrine. And you're gonna be an unstable house. You have to go to the Father. And you have to ask the Father, show me the truth. You have to pray, give me the Holy Spirit to open my eyes to all truth. Because that's the Holy Spirit's job, is for you to get the Word into you and for the Holy Spirit to guide and direct you into all truth so that we can worship Yeshua as sons of light, worshiping Him not in vain worship, but in spirit and in the truth. We don't want to be giving power to Satan and to the powers of darkness in this day and age. It's, there's no more time for that. We've got to come into the light. 
We've got to walk in the light. We have to be sons and children of the light. Now let's talk about manna. Manna falls in the morning for six days, and this establishes the days of the week. We read this in Exodus 16, 19 through 22. And Moses said, Let no man leave of it till the morning. Notwithstanding, they hearkened not unto Moses, but some of them left of it until the morning, and it bred worms, and it stank. And Moses was wroth with them, and they gathered it every morning, every man according to his eating. And when the sun waxed hot, it melted. And it came to pass that on the sixth day they gathered twice as much bread, and they laid it up till the morning, as Moses bade. And it did not stink, neither was there any worm therein. Now we know that Yeshua is the bread of life. And the manna came in the morning when Yah said, Let there be light. Light also means life. And this is when the manna came in the mornings. Every morning they would go out and collect the manna. And it came to pass on the sixth day that they gathered twice as much bread. And when they laid it up until the morning, it didn't stink. In John 6, 33, we read, For the bread of Elohim is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. The creation, the forming, the shaping of the world began when Yah said, Let there be light. That light was Yeshua, who giveth life unto the world. In John 6.35, it says, And Yeshua said unto them, I am the bread of life, the bread of life which came every morning and established when the Shabbat was. In John 6.48, again, I am the bread of life. In John 6.51, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. Morning begins the new day, which is when the manna fell. And each person took only enough to eat for one day. If they kept it until morning, they had not kept it for only one day. They had gone into the next day and it stank and it was full of worms. We see that manna could not be stored until the next morning, the next day. They took enough to eat for one day only. And it came in the morning, and if any existed the following morning, it was a different day, and it was rotten. So here in Scripture we see that manna, the Passover lamb, and the peace offering all represent Yeshua the life, the light, and the peace of the world. We see the manna in Exodus 16, 19, 19 through 22. And Moses said, let no man leave of it till the morning. Because that's another day. The Passover lamb in Numbers 9, 12. They shall leave none of it unto the morning. Again, that's when the 15th day begins in the morning. And in the peace offering of Leviticus 7.15, And the flesh of the sacrifice of his peace offering for thanksgiving shall be eaten the same day that it is offered. He shall not leave any of it until the morning. So that means that in the evening and when darkness fell, it was still the same day. The only time that the day changes to the next day or the morrow is in the morning. And if any of it remained in the morning, it had to be destroyed. We see the same thing with the Passover lamb. We see the same thing with the manna, that the manna was rotten as soon as it was morning. 
Now compare that to vows or voluntary offerings in Leviticus 7.16. But if the sacrifice of his offering be a vow or a voluntary offering, it shall be eaten the same day that he offereth his sacrifice. And on the morrow also the remainder of it shall be eaten. So here we have a sacrifice that can be eaten the same day. And when the morrow arrives, which would be the morning when the other sacrifice could not be eaten, here, this sacrifice, on the morrow, you can still eat the remainder of it. Morrow means the next day. And the root word of that is makar. Tomorrow, the day following the present day. So you see the difference between the peace offering and the voluntary offering. The peace offering has to be in the same day. And it says, he shall not leave any of it until the morning. However, the voluntary offering can be eaten the same day that it's offered and on the morrow, after the morning, you can still eat the remainder of it. The morrow or tomorrow is determined by the morning. It's not determined by the evening, the night, the darkness. We also see that there are seven feasts in the first seven months. Three of them are from evening to evening. You've got Passover and unleavened bread and the Day of Atonement. These are noteworthy exceptions to the rule of a day. These are explicit pictures of Yeshua rescuing his people from death. That's why these are exceptions to the regular reckoning of a day. The world was in darkness, death, and misery until the light, the life, the peace of Yeshua entered the world when Elohim said, let there be light. These are the feasts, Passover, the Passover lamb, the unleavened bread, the bread of affliction, and the day of atonement. These are the feasts that highlight our inability to save ourselves. Remember David comparing his distress of being surrounded by his enemies and being in darkness and, and that the grave was trying to take him. And he compares that to Yahweh uttering his voice and coming down and spreading light like arrows scattering the enemy, scattering the darkness and the wickedness and the misery and the death with light. That's why these feasts begin in the darkness, because it's a reminder that we were unable to save ourselves, just like David is unable to save himself from the grip of his enemies. He was without hope until the Father comes down and utters his voice, let there be light. And now the ability to be rescued and, and have life explodes on the earth. And David says that it chased away his enemies and that he was drawn up out of the earth. A picture of, of the Father shaping the earth on the third day. These feasts focus on Yeshua's perfection his repaying, amending, making peace between sinners and the Father, making a way. That's what he did. He came down and he made a way for life. Because before there was no hope, it was just darkness. But when he came into the world, when he came down and he died and he was resurrected, he opened up the way for us to be rescued like David was rescued from the grip of his enemies. Now, in the death and the resurrection story, we also find more evidence of a morning to morning observance of a day. In Matthew 27, 57 through 58, it says, Now, when evening had come, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who himself had also become a disciple of Yeshua. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Yeshua. Then Pilate commanded the body 
be given to him. Notice when Yeshua's body was requested. It says very clearly, when evening had come. In an evening to evening reckoning, this would mean that the high Sabbath of the 15th day, the first day of unleavened bread, had already begun when the body is requested by Joseph of Arimathea. But that is not what we see in the story of his death and burial. We've got a hundred pounds of myrrh and aloes. And we see this in John chapter 19, verse 39. And Nicodemus, who at first came to Yeshua by night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Yeshua and bound it in strips of linen with the spices as the custom of the Jews is to bury. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden and in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So there they laid Yeshua's body because of the Jews preparation day for the tomb was nearby. Now remember, evening has already come. It should be in an evening to evening reckoning already the 15th day. It should already be the Sabbath. And yet they're spending all of this time, a process that would have taken hours, a hundred pounds of myrrh and aloes bound in strips of linen. This is not a short, quick process. And we see that it's because it's of the Jews' preparation day. It is still preparation day. It is still the 14th day. The Sabbath, the 15th day, had not begun. And we get further confirmation of this with the women at the tomb on preparation day. In Luke chapter 23, verse 54, then he took it down, wrapped it in linen, and laid it in a tomb, hewn out of the rock where no one had lain before. That day was the preparation, and the Sabbath drew near. And the women who had come with him from Galilee followed after, and they observed the tomb, and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and fragrant oils and they rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. Right there where it says that day was the preparation. It's after sundown, and it's still preparation day. And the Sabbath drew near. That's epiphosko. That is a Greek word that means to grow light or to dawn. So the Sabbath began to grow light to dawn. And that is when the women left to go home to observe the Sabbath. Epiphosko is also the same word that we find in Matthew 28, 1. This is the women returning to the tomb and finding him resurrected. Now, after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Epiphosco, to grow light, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. It's the same word. The Sabbath began and ended at light. It began to dawn, which was the next day, and that's when we see them approaching the tomb. Now there are some problems using an evening to evening reckoning for Passover and Day of Atonement. Most importantly, though, we miss the profound message that Yah is teaching us in understanding the light of the world, the life of the world, the peace offering that Yeshua was for us. Now, logistically, an evening to evening reckoning for a day doesn't work when it's applied to the feast. The Day of Atonement, for example, is one day, beginning on the evening of the ninth and concluding on the evening of the tenth day. The special instruction isn't even necessary if this is the normal method of reckoning for a day. 
in Leviticus 23, verses 27 and 32. Also, on the tenth day of the seventh month, there shall be a day of atonement. In the ninth day of the month, at even, from even to even, shall ye celebrate your Sabbath. So here we have the day of atonement is the tenth day, but it begins on the evening of the ninth day. However, you cannot begin at the evening of the ninth day and conclude the next evening at sunset and have any portion of the Day of Atonement fall on the tenth day of the seventh month. It doesn't work. So in conclusion, I just want to say that we must test our traditions with the scriptures. We must go to the Father and ask Him to reveal the truth, the, the earthly textual understanding, the scholarly understanding, along with the spiritual understanding, the higher understanding that we can only get through the Father and we can only get through the Holy Spirit leading us. We are called to cast off our former darkness and to walk in the light. That is the great commission that we are to go out and we are to find those in darkness and show them the light, turn them away from the powers and the dominion of Satan and bring them into the kingdom of light, the king of peace, Yeshua. And I just want to say that observing a calendar rooted in darkness is contrary to the written word and the spiritual understanding of darkness representing wickedness, misery, chaos, and confusion. We are not to be walking in wickedness, misery, chaos, and confusion. We are to be walking in the light, in the truth, worshiping in spirit and in truth. We are living in an amazing time right now when so many things are being unveiled for us. In Isaiah chapter 42, verse 16, it says, and I will bring the blind by a way that they knew not. I will lead them in paths that they have not known. I will make darkness light before them and crooked things straight. These things I will do unto them and not forsake them. Do you understand that we are seeing this right now? We are seeing truths revealed to us the Spirit is opening our eyes to things that we have not known. We are coming out of the darkness and into the light, and we are being called to walk in that light, to represent the light of the world in everything that we do, including our worship. Right now, there is an unveiling that is taking place, and the Spirit of Yah is being poured out He's restoring truth, and He's making our path straight. And I just pray that you would listen to this teaching, that you would study the scriptures for yourselves, and that you would go to the Father, not your brother, not someone else, but go to the Father and pray for the Spirit to reveal all truth to you, to give you a deeper understanding so that we can all come together as sons of light and fulfill the commission of finding those in the world that are lost and that are seeking desperately, that cannot save themselves like David, and they're begging for rescue. They're begging for the light of Yeshua. I just thank you so much for listening to this study, and I'll just be praying for all of you. Thank you.